Okay, welcome to Part C, Lecture 11. I've revised things a little bit for this uh, the this portion of the, this final portion of the lecture. Parts A and B were a little longer than I thought they would be, and so I'm I'm going to uh, to shorten Part C a bit, and and we'll look at the silverization of China and India and Japanese silver and and all the rest. We'll look at that for Part A of Lecture 12 instead. All right. <laughs> All of this incoming silver and gold causes what economics cause what economic historians have called the price revolution. Now it's not a revolution in the sense of you know people overturning their government or anything of that sort, but revolution in the sense of a transformation, a, a really big change, alteration occurs. And in this case, alteration occurs in prices. Inflation not just in Spain. We already looked at Spanish inflation. It, and inflation hit Spain first. Inflation hit Spain first. But then as coin flees Spain because of the price specie flow mechanism, which I described in lecture A, or part A, coin then enters other European countries, England, France, Holland, Germany. And across the board in Europe, prices soar. Generally speaking, and, and it depends on what part of Europe you're talking about and what period, across the board, generally speaking, prices rose 500% during this century-long period. By about the middle of the 17th century, things begin to uh, have leveled off before this 100-year this 100 period. 500% rise in prices. Silver, particularly, plunges in value. Look at these uh, gold or these imports during this period, this 100 year period. Gold imports 180 tons. Now that's a lot of gold. Okay, that's a lot of gold. 180 tons. Sheesh. But compare that to silver 16,000 tons of silver. Absolutely incredible. So silver is the big you know, makes the biggest move of all. But gold falls in value too. But silver falls even uh, more in value than gold. And this is reflected in the silver-gold ratio. Now, uh, this ratio, what it means is in the year 1400, at the beginning of the 15th century, if you wanted to acquire one ounce of gold, it cost you nine ounces of silver. So that was a ratio. Nine ounces of silver equaled one ounce of gold. In the marketplace. Silver was relatively expensive. Okay, This is what, if you recall from the medieval lecture, or the uh, uh, lecture, it might have been the last lecture actually, um, during the high middle ages and renaissance, there was a silver mining boom in Europe, in Germany, in parts of Central Europe, because silver was relatively expensive. By 1550, it's adjusted a bit, largely because of European silver mining, to 11 to 1. But look at that. By 1650, 15 to 1. 15 to 1. That's a big drop in the price of silver relative to gold. And actually, the, the, it, this ended up bankrupting many of the European silver mines. Because the underground mines, you know, uh, they... Mining companies and, and miners needed to uh, uh, dig deeper and deeper into the ground to access the silver, which required a lot of technology, capital equipment. It was expensive to dig deeper into the ground. As the price of silver falls, it's no longer profitable to spend that capital and all that labor going deep into the ground to get the silver because it's just, silver is just not worth that much anymore. So many of these silver mines in Europe uh, uh, go bankrupt. The price revolution in turn gives way, and, and they're complementary, they're very similar, to another revolution that economic historians have written much about, including yours truly, the commercial revolution. The commercial revolution. As global commerce, for the first time, like a truly global commerce, 
blossoms. Money, decidedly, for for really the the uh, and money is already starting to head this way anyway. Prior to the 16th century, but now definitely, money replaces land as the most desirable commodity in Europe. Now, land is still extraordinarily powerful, right? Um, land is still very value, valued in Europe all the way up through the 19th century. You could say today, too, obviously, land has a lot of value. But um, prior to the 16th or 17th century, you know, you, if you wanted to be anybody, you had to have land. Land was it. If uh, Land signaled your power and, and influence. Now, all of a sudden money enters into the equation it's not just about land money and who has the money merchants merchants as a result of this commercial revolution now exercise far more influence over po politics and just social influence than at any previous time in european history prior to the commercial revolution actually to to be a merchant and to and to engage in money making was actually seen as dishonorable if you can believe that it, it's dishonorable and degrading to involve oneself in money making the the uh the upper class the gentry uh were landed and it was a more respectable way of living because you didn't, you know, you're not scrounging everywhere for money, right? Uh, you can live a more leisured life, and in that leisure, uh, that that is where your your social influence came from, and your and your um, all sorts of different hobbies and and uh, um, uh, educational pursuits and and. and uh, different customs and traditions, depending on, on where you are living. The landed elite were, were very uh, uh, invested in those things. The merchant, the merchant uh, is working his butt off, right, for money. Um, the merchant is, is a, a very different figure, cuts a very different type of figure than the landed gentry. And with the commercial revolution, for the first time, the merchant has some respect. And, and merchants began to rise up the social ladder. Now, the landed gentry remained very, very powerful through the 19th century. So the landed gentry aren't just overthrown and that's that. But they take a hit, they take a hit. Actually, the landed gentry take a hit from the price revolution. Because with the price revolution, that did a number for the uh, uh, landlord's rent. So landlords collect rent, Oftentimes that, that rent was fixed and that was fixed income. And anytime you have fixed income and inflation begins appearing, uh, your real income adjusted for inflation goes down. And so the status of the merchant is rising, rising in a status vis-a-vis uh, -vis the landed gentry. This is why in England, the House of Commons begins flexing its muscle in the 17th in the early 17th century and eventually behead the king of england uh during the civil war in england in the in 1649 the house of commons was made up of merchants uh, dominated by merchants and these merchants now for the first time are able to exercise some control what we are witnessing here is a transition from feudalism to capitalism feudalism to capitalism it's a new era and, and as you can imagine, many of the, this old class of landed gentry were very envious of the merchant. And you can understand why. Also, as a result of the commercial, this commercial revolution, a shift in focus, the balance of power shifts from the Mediterranean to the Atlantic. Now it's all about the Atlantic. The Atlantic becomes a centerpiece of this commercial revolution. And as a result, the new powers coming out of the commercial revolution, England, Holland, France, Spain for a, little, for a bit before uh, Spain took a, uh, 
before Spain fell. But then Spain is replaced not by Italy, but by France, England, and Holland. A whole new world. Look at this map. Pretty incredible map from the 17th century. Wow. This one's even better. Look at that. Look at that. Pretty incredible. A merchant sees this and what does he see? Money. 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 And that's not necessarily bad if you're earning that money legitimately and, uh, and you're providing goods and services to people. And sure enough, this is the main defense of capitalism. Sure enough, as a result of that mercantile activity, the standard of living in Europe really begins to increase across the board uh, compared to prior ages, prior centuries. Some pretty big advancements. Now, politically, with all this money and all this commerce really beginning to, to, to bloom, politically, Europe, especially Western Europe, consolidates behind the nation-state model the nation state model, European kingdoms and empires centralize and, and land upon what uh, one sociologist named Charles Tilley has called uh, capital, capitalized co coercion. A, a combination of capital on one end, the money and all the merchant mercantile activity, and then coercion, powerful states, powerful states. A lot of this money is, is financing, when it returns back to the country, is financing the growth of states, bureaucracies. Bureaucracies really begin to really burgeon during this period. Navies. This is why privateers are eventually abandoned. Because by the end of the 17th century, you don't really need privateers anymore because you have a large navy that you've built as a state and now you directly control. Privateers can go rogue, so you dump privateers. And then armies, just vast armies. Louis the Fourteenth, who's pictured there. Louis the Fourteenth just has this incredible army. 300,000 men. That requires a lot of money. A lot of money. And that money is provided. It's coming in. It's pouring into state coffers. Look at the, the consolidation here. This is France in 1477. All these just different states and you know autonomous zones and now the map of Europe. Holy Roman Empire is still just kind of a, a mosaic, but France, Great Britain, the Habsburg Dominions, the Ottoman Empire. Get to them in a second. Prussia, Sweden, consolidated states. The European nation state model. I love this portrait here, this or this painting. Louis the Fourteenth. We'll talk about him a little bit, a little later. Look at that. The globe. The globe. The world. There's a, a new awareness of, of how vast the world is and how much not only money can be made, but also also how much power can be had. What a man. What a man. Look look at him right there. Louis XIV. There's actually a lot to admire about Louis XIV. A lot to admire about Louis XIV. Absolute monarch. No doubt about that. But very effective absolute monarch. Very effective absolute monarch. This is, so just all in all, by the, by the 16th and the 17th century especially, by 17th century, the momentum is on the side of Western Europe um, and Europe in general. The latest scientific advancements are coming out of Europe. Galileo, Copernicus, uh, uh, Kepler. The latest geographical and discoveries are coming out of Europe. Uh, the newest philosophical ideas. Descartes, Francis Bacon, the scientific method. Naval power, new military technology, and then, of course, all the wealth from the Americas. This really is the beginning of uh, what you could say is European hegemony. And, and Europe begins to move, to move ahead of the other old world civilizations. And, and, and it's pretty rapid. It happens pretty quickly. 
some historians call this the Great Divergence, when Europe really begins to to uh, uh, soar ahead of, of some of the other old world civilizations. Whereas prior to this period, eh, for, you know, kind of even a bit. Sometimes Europe was down, sometimes up, sometimes China was up, sometimes down, and same with the Middle East. And, and it's all revolving around trade and money. And, and I don't want to overstate the importance of American silver and American silver and gold in this. Uh, I think the momentum was already on the side of the Europeans as it was. I mean, there were other things at work here than just pure, you know, specie, gold and silver from the Americas. But the gold and silver from the Americas goes a long way in, in financing so much of this activity. It costs money to run a state. It costs money to administer a state, to, to build these armies. That's not cheap. You can't just snap your fingers and, and get it, even if the idea is there. The, the silver and, and gold from the Americas goes a long way in, in, in helping Europeans achieve that. Now, um, into the 17th century... Um, the Ottoman Empire actually is still extraordinarily powerful into the 17th century. And actually, the Ottomans were at their peak in the 16th century. After Columbus, after Cortez, the Ottoman Empire is still extraordinarily powerful because most trade routes between West and East are still going over land. Still going over land. You remember this, this map? This is before Da Gama reached India from around the Cape of Good Hope. But even after Da Gama does that, that's a long route. That's a very long route. And it's expensive. It's dangerous. And for, you know, a good hundred years, actually, after Da Gama, there's no more than, no more than five to ten ships going around the Cape of Good Hope every year. That's not anywhere near the traffic needed to satisfy trade between West and East. And so the Middle East remains extremely important so long as those overland routes are still used or overland or through the Red Sea, because that was still a popular route. Now, there's no Suez Canal yet. Suez Canal doesn't come until the 19th century. But even before the Suez Canal, you, you would land here in Egypt, unload your goods, it was expensive to do all this, but unload your goods and then put them on a ship in the Red Sea and then go to India that way. The Suez Canal was huge, but the, the technology wasn't there yet to build the Suez Canal. But so either way, Red Sea or overland, Ottoman Empire is in a very strategic place. Now, to give you a hint that the Ottoman Empire, or to illustrate how the, powerful the Ottoman Empire remained, this is the Ottomans in 1481, the Ottoman Empire of 1520. The Ottoman Empire in 1566. So there's, you know, you see their control here. So the overland route and then the Red Sea route. The Red Sea route, Ottomans control. Ottomans control the Eastern Mediterranean. There's 1622. And then look how deep into Europe the Ottoman Empire. I mean, the Ottomans are right there in the gates of Vienna. In fact, there's a very famous battle in 1683 in Vienna. The Ottomans lose that battle. But the, the uh, Ottomans totally have conquered southeastern Europe. And this is well over a century after uh, Columbus. So, you know, it's not, this doesn't happen overnight. This was uh, one of the most successful Ottoman sultans, Suleiman the Magnificent, pictured here. We'll see you next time for lecture 12 the impact of the Dutch and the English getting in the game, because the Dutch and the English find a way to, to make this route around Africa to the east, to India, into China. They find a way to make that the primary route, bypassing the Middle East altogether, and that will contribute in large measure to the, uh, to the decline of the Ottoman Empire, beginning in the, seven, in the late 17th century and definitely into the 18th century. But uh, we will go there um, uh, next time for lecture 12. So I will see you then. Uh, until then, I, I hope all is well and God bless.